Aglidity, your host of the Freedom Series live stream session as part of the Comeback Game podcast. And today I've got all the way from San Francisco, I've got Larry Jacobson, uh, who is an award-winning author, motivational speaker, life planning coach, specializing in retirement and circumnavigation. And uh, Larry kind of believes that retirement's not the end, but rather the opportunity for new beginnings. Uh, Larry is a leading authority on non-fiscal retirement planning. Uh, Larry also uses the successful experience of his own business career and retirement from a corporate world and from achieving his personal dreams as a proven model for his coaching. His experience has attracted coaching clients from all walks of life, including entrepreneurs, CEOs, doctors, attorneys, teachers, public figures, and political candidates. Larry, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Yeah, so grateful to have you here, mate. And um, I also, also just want to say a quick welcome to anyone who's watching this live or on the replay from anywhere on the interwebs. Um, Rafi, one of my incredible team members, is uh, checking it all out across the web and is going to feed through any questions or comments that you guys have got. So please, let's make this show as interactive as possible. Hit the like button now. Let us know that you're watching and uh, keep the comments and questions coming below. So, mate, You've got a very interesting story, uh, which you've written about in your multi-award winning book, where you circumnavigated uh, the world. You, you've got over 50,000 blue water miles under your keel. <laughs> where, where did that idea come about? Like what prompted you to go, hey, I'm just going to throw my life onto a boat and, and take off around the world? Yeah, well, it was a, it was a dream that I had had for a long time. I actually taught myself to sail when I was 13. And, wow. and ever since that, ever since I first stepped foot in a sailboat, I decided, oh, I'm going to sail around the world. And it's, you know, it's, it's the Everest of sailing. I right? you know it's the, yeah. it's the biggest thing you can do. And um, I, I just kept that dream alive for a long time. And uh, I, you know, had, you know, visions of it, of it happening. And I mean, it was like when I would, I would be at work and I would close my eyes and I would just picture or vision I could see myself sailing back underneath the Golden Gate Bridge after completing the circumnavigation. Wow. I, mean, I could see other boats coming out to greet us. I could see people standing on the bridge, uh, greet, you know, shouting and greeting us. I could taste the champagne on the dock after doing it. And that was years before doing it. Wow. And yeah. So it's a, it was a, a, it's a proof that visualization works and writing down your goals works. Yeah. 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 So, so at that point in time, um, were you the only person that, that had completed some, some, that, that kind of a feat? Oh no. No, they had sailed around the world. Yeah. No, about, um, they say about 60 people a year complete a circumnavigation yeah. worldwide. Yeah. Um, that was, that was pre, you know, COVID. So, yeah. uh, I suppose it's less now, but it might be more. It, yeah, or maybe more. Yeah, if I still had the boat, I think I would might just head out to sea. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's extremely difficult to achieve. Um, yeah. for most people who leave from the west coast to the United States end up finishing in New Zealand or Australia, and this is then selling the boat or shipping it back or or something. And uh, because it's, that's then it starts to get really hard sailing up through yeah. Indonesia and, and that. Yeah. 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 So no, it's a, it's something that people do. A lot of people attempt, but not many achieve it. It's a small club. So, so you're a CEO um, of a fairly large company prior to that. Yeah. The company yeah. was, um, uh, we were an incentive travel company. Um, and oh, wow. Yeah. So those are the days of, in of incentives where, you know, a company would offer to the sales force, say, if you achieve 20% more this year, then we're going to take you on this incredible trip to Sydney, for example. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we went to Sydney a lot with groups and, uh, <laughs> you know, we didn't created events that they just couldn't create. People couldn't create on their own. So there was this real desire for them to earn the trip and get there. And, uh, I was in that industry for 20 years. Wow. The CEO and then sold the company, um, in 1998. Uh, they kept me on for three years because they wanted my contacts and clients. Yeah. And then uh, after that, um, I bought the boat and out the gate I went. Right. Yeah. And so this was purely for personal fulfillment, a, a dream that you'd had for a long period of time to go and do that. 
Was it something yeah. that you did alone or did you have a crew with you? No, I actually sailed out the gate with uh, uh, four other crew on board. It was a 50 foot sailboat. Yeah. And um, then by the time I got, uh, we got down to Mexico, there were three of us left because two only were coming for the, for a short ride anyway. <laughs> And then for most of the uh, circumnavigation, it was just myself and my partner who was a crew member. And then we became partners as, as, we, uh, as we went through the journey. Yeah. And so it was most, for the most part, the two of us. Yeah. How long did it take for you to, to do the full circumnavigation? Six years. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it doesn't take six years to sail no. a boat around the world. Um, we, we logged 44, let's see, I think 40,000 miles, 40,400 or something like that. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take six years, but the issue about sailing around the world is you have to follow the weather. Yeah. So you might, when we sailed out down across the Pacific ocean and going island hopping, you know, from Tonga and, you know, and, and those islands, uh, South, you know, French Polynesia and that. Uh, you have about six months before hurricane season sets in, or as you guys would call it, cyclone season. And uh, then you've got to get out of the cyclone area. So what do you do? Well, you head south to New Zealand. Yeah. And then you sit there waiting for hurricane season to pass. And then you, when we went back up into the Pacific, do another six months, and then back down to Australia. And we lived in the lovely, wonderful town of Malulaba. Ah. Uh. When, that, was our, that was our la our landfall in uh, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so great. tell me then, I've got a bunch of questions coming through uh, here. Please, guys, keep them coming through. I've got a bunch of questions myself as well. Um, the first question I've got is, like six years on a boat with the same people, uh, 50, <laughs> 50 foot or not, like what was that like managing the relationships and especially like if you met your partner there and you guys – you know, hooked up and connected there. Like, what was that like being on a boat with the same people for that amount of time? Yeah, it's um, it, it's a it's a test of your uh, abilities to get along. That's for sure. It's a test of leadership, uh, as far as kept being captain of of when we crossed the Pacific. There were uh, five of us going across the Pacific, and um, also when it was like just the two of us, we decided that it be, it was like a dog year. So each year was seven years. So if it took us six years to go, that means that we were together for 42 years. Um, wow. But it's a, uh, it is a challenge um, to, you have to manage people in addition to managing the boat. And you have to make sure that each person has, is engaged and, and has a role in, in sailing of the boat and in keeping the systems operating of the boat you know, the boat runs 24 seven, there's no place to stop and rest for the night. And so you, you know, you set up your watch schedule and some people don't like that, the watch schedule and they didn't like their job or whatever. And there was times when some crew members didn't get along, you know, and I locked, one time I locked two of them in my cabin and I said, don't come out and tell your friends. Um, yeah, well, there's nothing that you can do. I mean, there's yeah. 50, 50 feet is, is a big boat in the marina when you're maneuvering but when you're at sea it's really really small yeah yeah so it's, did, a, it's a challenge how did the life skills that you learned through being a successful ceo play out with captaining the ship and and such a small crew like i'm curious to know i guess like what skill sets because you know if you're able to manage that like it, i can imagine that there, there would have been times like it's not not all smooth sailing so to speak there would have been times right. there was challenges and stresses amplified the fact that you are stuck on a small boat in a big sea with very few people, you know? So I can imagine if you can successfully get through that and come out the other side better for it, there's a lot of life lessons or skill sets you can then apply back into business as yeah, well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and they, they go back and forth. I mean, yeah. they apply to, to both. Um, uh, for, I would say, um, uh, first of all, managing people is probably the key. Um and then, uh, and, and I learned a lot of that as in business about mm -hmm. managing people. And, um, I would say, uh, uh, managing your fears and the fears of your crew. Um, you know, there was a time in the red sea when, uh, I, we had, uh, two crew members 
and myself. So there were three of us and we were caught in a storm, the worst storm of our lives actually. And it was the Red Sea, it was, I call it the Hell Sea. And, uh, and I also know why Moses walked across because it's too rough to sail. And, <laughs> but it's, um, we, we were hit by 60 knot winds that lasted for 24 hours and built the seas up to 30 feet. Wow. And it was just horrendous. I mean, it was just pounding and pounding. And I was uh, trying to, and I had gotten us into that situation. I had made a, a mistake in a weather call. And so I felt really responsible for getting us out. And at one point I looked over at my crew and their eyes were just, you know, as wide as saucers, you know, when they're looking at these waves and I was realizing that shit, the last thing I needed was a crew frozen with fear. You know, I needed a crew who was motivated and, you know, and, and to get to help get us out of there. So, you know, it's like, OK, Larry, you're captain. You better start acting like one. And, um, you know, and, and you, you bring in all the motivational skills that you can muster to say, you know, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Here's what I need you to do. And here's what I need you to do. And and um, yeah, so um, I would say. Uh, kind of knowing your goals and your course and sticking to them. Uh, one time there was a, we were sailing across the Pacific and uh, I was, I was down below and I was, uh, I come up on, I was down below and I realized, God, the boat seems awfully smooth. So I came up on deck and I looked at, looked around and it was all just, we were sailing beautifully. And then I looked at the compass and I realized that we were 15 degrees north of our, of our course. So if we had kept on that course for much longer, we were going to miss Tahiti. So I said to the person at the helm, what are you doing? We're 15 degrees off course. And he says, well, it's more comfortable this way. And I said, yeah, but if we, it, you have, we know our course, we have to stick to our course or we're not going to make our goal, which is Tahiti. Hmm. So that's so it's just like business. I was going to say, isn't that so representational of business? You know, like obviously through the work we do at the Game Change, we get to work with a lot of different business owners and businesses. And, you know, I see that a lot. I see so many business owners, entrepreneurs that have the best intention to hire a coach and to grow their business. But the reality is, is so many of them are just not willing to do what it takes because they're used to being comfortable. Even though in many, many cases, being comfortable is actually very painful. But because they're used to it, because that's what they know, they're happier to stay there than to try something different than to actually, you know, stay to the course to achieve their goals. That's right. And, and, part, and part of that is, is the ability to inspire others yeah. and to, to share. You know, this was my dream to sail around the world. It wasn't these, the crew members or, or, nor my partners. But somehow I was able to inspire them that this was something worth doing and that we, that we needed to do together. And, um, you know, I relied on them and gave them uh, a role, a big enough role so that they felt it was theirs. Yeah. And that also applies to business. Um, take, so, and, and the ability to take a risk, too, and the willingness to take a risk. I mean, obviously, yeah. it's, uh, you know, and I have, of course, had no idea when I sailed out the gate, Golden Gate, what the risks I was taking. I just thought, well, this will be great. I got to do this. And so uh, here's my chance. I'm going. Well, well, well I was not prepared for that. <laughs> Typical entrepreneur's attitude, right? Like, exactly. Oh, just gonna, yeah. just gonna, we can just do gonna this. go for it. <laughs> we can go for it. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Would, it, would it be fair in saying, Larry, that you you brought the team into and, and inspired them with your vision, mission, and values? Yes. Yes, it would be fair to say. Um, because it, it wasn't theirs. I mean, you know, for the most part, I think they, the people who sailed with me they thought, well, sailing is cool. It's fun. We'll have a good time. We're going to go to the South Pacific and, you know, and um, then it just ended up the two of us. And then it was a matter of, okay, Ken, will you help me get this boat all the way around the world? Yeah. And um, yeah. So I, uh, I guess I did inspire him. I hope yeah. so. Would you believe that it was because of, of that inspiration and alignment to vision mission days? That was what made the trip a success? Like it wasn't necessarily your ability to, to sail, like although that played a part in it, but the bigger part was, was I guess, the vision 
of, of what you guys wanted to create the mission and making sure that everyone was alignment to values, i.e. locking them in the cabin until they got along, <laughs> i.e. you know, bringing them back into alignment with the course, i.e. you know, you, you seeing them and seeing that you had the responsibility when shit got real and there was 30 foot waves coming over to course correct and to, to inspire them because you, you, were, you were the one that had actually made the wrong call, took accountability for that and then did what needed to be done to get yourself out. Yes. And also I would say it's the ability to, um, to be flexible. Um, you know, we know that we have to be able to pivot in business uh, quickly and boy, does that come up in sailing uh, yeah. and, and to, to deal with the unexpected. Yeah. And I would say also to be proactive rather than reactive, yeah. which is something that I teach in business a lot, you know, and, and I'm sure you do too. That it, you know, don't wait for the, you know, for the catastrophe. See it in advance. Um, when you're anchoring a boat in a beautiful bay, and you know, and it looks this looks fantastic because the wind is going this direction. Well, you have to picture in your mind what happens if the wind shifts, hmm. and it goes and it's the other direction, and you, and the shore is then right there. Yeah, and you have to be able to, you know predict that, and that's being proactive, and the same yeah. thing in business. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. I would say, um, but reacting uh, uh, and the ability to roll with the punches, we had so many breakdowns, mechanical breakdowns, and I was not really all that mechanical, um, but, you know, we got through them. I mean, one time yeah. we sat in Kupang. I don't know if you know where Kupang is in Indonesia. It's just not uh, it, North Australia. Yeah. And uh, just it's just North Australia. <laughs> and uh, we sat there for three weeks waiting for parts coming from uh, Sydney and Perth. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, 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 you know, we didn't know how to put in a new transmission, but we found people who did. Yeah. We found a tractor farmer from, uh, from Australia who was a mechanic. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Um, I, w- I want to dive a bit deeper on that, uh, that point there. Before I do that, there's a bunch of questions coming in I'd love to, to, to um, ask you. And, and please, if you're watching live today, uh, keep the questions coming. One here from uh, Charles from Brisbane. Uh, I was able to see that Larry is not only a speaker, but a retirement expert too. If Larry could share his top retirement advice, what would these be? And how did COVID change his retirement strategies for others? Yeah. Um, bigger questions. Great question. Um, first of all, in retirement, I would say that one of the keys is you're not retiring from necessarily from something but it's important to, to know what are you retiring to? Mm. So I like to have people redefine their retirement. You're not just quitting. I mean, that's just old. That was like our parents' parents, you know, and you know, you worked hard and then you played golf for a year and then you died. Um, but that's not us. We are living 20 to 30 years longer than our parents. And so it's a matter of, well, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? What are you going to do next? What's your encore? Mm. And that's really important that you just, you know, if you think when I ask people, what are you going to do when you retire? The answer I usually hear is, well, I'm going to sleep late. I'm going to travel and play golf. Mm. And I go, yeah, then what? What? Is there anything else I need? Yeah. In about six months, you're going to come and see me because you're going to be bored to tears. Yeah. And, you know, it's, and, and, and the higher, the higher they, they uh, the higher they are, the harder they fall. So a CEO, an attorney, you know, president of a company, they're the ones who really struggle with retirement. If your name was on the door of the company, you better be retiring to something else. Well, because in many, many ways, and this is there's there's one interesting thing that you just shared there, and this other point that I want to touch on, and that's what I've noticed as well is that. You know, we help our clients to, uh, you know, build profitable businesses that can work without them. Now, part of it working without them is meaning that we have to get the business owner out of it. And, you know, the hardest part is not putting in place, you're helping them put in place the systems and the process and the team. The hardest part is helping the business owner, the entrepreneur, to shift their identity in such a way they can step away and the business still, still operates without them creating sabotage. Now, I would say that's exactly the same as we're talking about here with what you do, is if they've been a CEO, they've had the name on the door of a company for many, many years, consciously and unconsciously, they have so much of their identity wrapped up in that business. Now, it seems like a good idea to play more golf and sleep in late, but yet they're missing the fact that there's no purpose in that. 
right. there's no there's nothing they're moving towards and this is the point i want to touch on what you said which i thought was really interesting is um you know in, instead of like what are you moving away from what are you moving towards now exactly. the reason that i say that is because i see so many entrepreneurs and let's be honest humans in general that spend their life trying to move away from situations and wonder why they can only get so far before they get stuck. Yet the ones that are able to flip that and, and find something more compelling to move towards are the ones that more successfully build that momentum and build that progress and that growth in life. That's exactly right. Um, you know, throughout our lives, pretty much our lives are scripted. You know, you go through school and maybe you go to college or maybe you go in the military or, you know, whatever, you know, but, you know, you go from from one step to the next to the next and you know what's coming next. And so, you know, that you, so you're looking forward, even if it's subconsciously. Then you get maybe into, you know, into business and you're, you know, you're working on your business and, and everything. And then you think, OK, I have a chance to get out now. You know, I can sell my business or I can. You know, uh, you know, I can take more time off or whatever. Um, but with without having something to go to, that you're going towards next, your your page on your script is blank. So it's opportunity. You get to write the script and do whatever it is that you want to do. But if you don't, you're just looking at a blank page, and you know, you wake up at you know, 10 o'clock or something. And, and then you go, well, gee, it's almost lunchtime, you know, and then, you know, and then it's almost cocktail time and, and, and you, you lose this purpose and fulfillment. Okay. You don't have to run it. If you're a CEO, you don't have to then go run a business, another business, but you can use your skills and your expertise of what you did learn and, and, and know in business for other purposes. You can, you can give back. Um, yeah. The happiest clients that I have from my retirement coaching are those who are giving back in some way, whether they're mentoring or teaching or um, even getting involved in another company, but, you know, on a, on a maybe a board of directors type you know, yeah. situation or something, but they're giving back and, then, yeah. and, and money is not the focus anymore. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's there's so much power in that. And I've certainly experienced that in my own life and witnessed many clients. It's like, once we get to that stage where we're no longer in scarcity in survival mode, once we get to the stage where we have, you know, a consistent stream of, of cash coming through that supports our lifestyle, it's almost like the next step naturally is how can I contribute? How can yeah. I make a, a difference to the world? Because, you know, I, I've met entrepreneurs that are like, oh, I'm just not fulfilled anymore. I'm just not happy anymore. It's like, well, what are your goals? It's like, oh, you know, to earn another half a million, to earn another million. It's like, well, that, that's why it is because you're not even freaking spending the money you've got, number one. But right. number two, like 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 another couple of zeros in the paycheck is not going to change the way you feel because it's no longer challenging you. You need That's to find right. a way to, to transmute that energy into making a difference and contributing to others. And yeah. when we go down that path, there's no limitation of that. There's no like you get to a place it's like, oh, I've done enough now. There's there's some self-perpetuation in wanting to actually contribute in a much bigger way. That's right. And and you, you're, you had mentioned earlier um, about your loss of identity. And that is the number one concern of retirees is what is losing their identity. And so that's why I, what, what I encourage people is to, to create a plan, you know, with a plan, at least you have something to change. Yeah. Right. But you've got to have a plan of what are you going to do? And it could be a one day plan. Like on the first day of retirement, I'm going to do this yeah. or a week or a month or a year or a whole, you know, the whole thing, but you start with a plan, Yeah. you know, uh, you know, we talk a lot about transitions, you know, and this is what we're, we're talking about really here is a transition. And I subscribe to the, the work of William Bridges, and he talks about how all transitions begin with an end. Mm. So you end something, and then you're in this middle area before you find what's next. And that middle area could last a day, a week, a month, a year, as you explore different things and try different things. But it's important to remember that that middle area is not a parking lot. It's yeah. not a place to stay. It's a place to move through. Yeah. Until you find that next thing that's going to give you that pur purpose and that fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. Start starting with end in mind is super, super important. And you know, if we relate this back to business, because I know a lot of our audience are entrepreneurs and business owners, is that you know, like 
my I believe that all companies should be started with end in mind, and I believe all companies should be started with uh, being able to build it so it operates simultaneously and outside of, of control of the CEO. Now, whether or not you actually choose to step out or not is irrelevant, but until yeah. you get to a business to a position where you can step out, you have a job, you don't have a business. And I've just met so many business owners that are, that are chained and locked up and locked into their business because they've built this job and this job that they have 20, 30, 40, 50 people relying on them day in, day out, like that's not, that's not a freedom business, that's a prison sentence. That's right. I remember a time in business when um, uh, I had been gone, I was gone for 30 days in a row. So I was on one trip and went from one trip to the next, to the next, to the next, you know, four different back-to-back -back trips all over the world. And when I came back into my office and I said to my assistant, I said, okay, I sat down at my desk. All right, what have you got for me? What do I need to sign? What do I need to you know, do? What, what, what issues have we got? And she goes, nothing, we're fine. And I, it was like, it took me aback because I was like, you're fine? But yeah. I've been gone for 30 days. And she goes, yeah, we're fine. Everything is going along just fine. And at that point I realized, huh, I could leave. And that was a couple of years before uh, before we sold the company. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. a good position actually to be in. It's like absolutely. Oh, okay. oh, and then I asked her, yeah, but how do you sign my? How do you sign? Oh, you know, my, and she goes, oh, Larry, I sign your name better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. And look, if you are watching and wanting to to build a profitable and purpose driven business that works without you, uh, make sure you grab a copy of my book. Uh, the path to freedom, the nine steps to build a profitable purpose-driven business that works without you. Uh, question here for Perry from Sydney. Greets to Larry. Two questions. What are people's top misconceptions about owning a yacht and going on long haul trips? Misconceptions about owning a yacht are um, that all will go well with the boat and nothing will break. I mean, it's just everything breaks on a boat. And when you're at sea in salt water, you know, just, I mean, everything corrodes and, and breaks and it, and you'll be filled with surprises. Um, and, uh, and, and sailing, here's the thing, you know, some people want to sail around the world. It's very few people, but a lot of people want to go sailing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I tell people is you don't have to sail around the world to find adventure, you know, to fulfill your, your dream or pursue your passion. You can just go sailing. And, you know, like if you're in California, you can sail down to Mexico and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, if you're in Sydney, you can go north to the, yeah. to the, you know, the Whitsundays. Yeah. And that's awesome. I mean, you know, I would, I don't think if we had our way, we would have just stayed in the Whitsundays. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and so I would say that thinking that you have to go too far and then not being prepared for the fact that what the word boat means which means break out another thousand. Yeah. yeah. I um, I think you could almost change the, the B word from boat to business as well. Like, think about it. Like people think that their business, they'll get their business to a position where it won't break. Oh. Yet I, I believe that our business is always broken. Um, and, and, and again, people believe they need to go and circumnavigate the globe with their business and build like a hundred million dollar company. When in actual fact, sometimes that's not your real goals. That's society's goals you've taken on board. You know, what if you had a business that paid you, you know, a quarter million dollar wage year in, year out that you don't really have to show up to? Like, imagine what you could do with your life then. Yes, exactly. That is, that's exactly right. And, you know, uh, and then I'm sure you teach this too. It's, you know, one of the biggest challenges is going from a small business to a medium sized business. And it's not always what you should be doing. Yeah. You know, and it's not, you shouldn't always be going from medium to large. Yeah. You know, it, it, that isn't the, the, that isn't the sign of success. Yeah. For me, sailing around the world and making it all the way was important. Yeah. But for most people, I would say just go sailing. That's a success. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it comes back. Thank you for Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> I think it comes back to what we said earlier, though, too, like just being clear of your vision. Like what's what's your outcome? For you, it was that. For you, it was getting around and it was like whatever it takes you didn't even, didn't even know the challenges and hurdles you'd, you'd come up against, but it's like, that's where I'm going and we're just going to make it happen. But but understand as well, like building a, big, a medium business or a big business comes with medium and big challenges. Yeah. Right? Like it's, 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 all, it's all relevant to... Uh, well, your priorities are, are, are critical. 
And, yeah. you know, I decided that my priority was to get us around the world. I did not think it was going to take six years. I had no idea really how long it was going to take. In fact, after uh, two years, I sold my house back home in order to pay for the rest of the trip. Um, you know, I didn't realize how much money it was going to cost. I didn't realize how long it was going to take. Um, but the priority was to get around the world. That was my A priority. You know, we have a we had on the boat a, a system of priorities, A, B, C, D. So A was it must be done, done before we leave the dock to go to sea. B was we should do this. C was it would be nice if we did this. Yeah. And D was don't count on it. You know, so like varnishing, you know, woodwork is it? Yeah started out as a D and it stayed a D, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but getting the boat around the world, everything feeds into that a, yeah. Everything that you do was all about getting the boat around the world and yeah. the same thing in your business with your visions. Yeah. One thing, if I would just might add something about, about visioning, you know, visioning your dream or visioning your, your, the picture of your success in business or, or whatever your venture is. Um, it's important uh, that people understand that when you vision something, when you see the vision, you must see yourself in the vision. Yeah. You can't just be, don't look at it from, oh, I'm looking at this picture like I'm watching a movie. You have to actually see yourself in that vision. Like I saw myself on the boat sailing back underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm. That was, that's a big difference to the success or failure of a vision, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great, great, great. Like, very well put. Um, two more questions here. So the, the next one, Barry, would you say people can end up with misconceptions too about the launch of a business and retirement? If so, what are the common ones that you see? What are the common mis misconceptions about retirement or around launching a business? Launching a business in retirement? Is that what you said? Uh, no, it's kind of two separate questions. Like what are the biggest misconceptions about launching a business uh, or moving into retirement? So uh, let me start with moving into retirement. And that is um, that when you retire, everything is just going to, you're just going to want to relax and do nothing. I mean, it's just, I, I see it over and over again. It's just, I don't know anybody who does is happy doing nothing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, maybe I'm, you know, a little bit different. I mean, I go to the beach and I think, mm, okay, what am I going to do now? You know, and, you know, I, I, I need to keep moving, you know, you know, to, do something, yeah. um, you, you, you're not going to be happy. And so you retire to something and, and, and have a goal, um, a plan, a vision. And in launching a business, um, I would say that a misconception is that you have to launch the next Facebook or Twitter. Yeah. You don't. You could launch, you could start a corner coffee shop and make a great living and be engaged with your community. And, you know, and I mean, it's uh, you, it doesn't have to be the big, huge, you know, right. business that people it, it's because there's so much press about it. But, you know, the majority of the world operates on small businesses. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and again, like what you said before, start with it in mind. Like, are you starting a business for the sake of starting a business or are you wanting to fulfill some sort of personal needs? Or do you have a vision to change millions of lives? Like just spend the time before you jump in you know, to actually get clear on like, what's my end game here? Like what's the yeah. purpose behind what I'm doing? Because that's going to do a lot more to actually get you there than just jumping in and then going, Oh, this is all too hard. I'm out again. Yeah. When that's right. And like when we were, you know, and I was in business at, at, at world-class incentives, we we became the darling of the industry. Uh, when we, we did a lot of the high tech companies in Silicon Valley, their programs and, you know, when they would burn through the other companies, they would, you know, they would come to us and say, we need something different and creative. And, you know, what can you guys do for us? And, you know, I think we always came through because our vision was that we will operate unique programs that are the best and we will provide the best customer service proactively. Mm. And it just blew our clients' minds as to how proactive we were in customer service yeah. and in handling their clients. And um, that was our goal. It wasn't to grow to be huge. Yeah. Um, and the fun part was that every time we went up against the big billion dollar incentive companies, we won. Yeah, amazing. They, yeah, they hated us. They would, they would have hated that. Yeah, they would have. Uh, last question here. 
What are Larry's favorite investment strategies, especially for these times? Don't buy a boat. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite investment strategies, um, I'm a non-financial retirement coach. I do not coach people on what to do with investments and, and what to do with their money. What I do say is if you're retiring and you have a certain uh, lifestyle in mind, can you afford it? And if you can't, well, then let's talk about changing your expectations. But I'm not, I'm not the one to ask about uh, financial advice. And I'm, um, yeah, all I can say is a boat is not a really great investment. Yeah. Um, and, but it, you know, it's sometimes you have to do things without all the information that you need. And sometimes you have to, you have to follow the right side of your brain and just go with your heart. And yeah. when I left San Francisco on the boat, I didn't really have a plan for my return. And I didn't have a plan for earning money when I returned. And, but I needed to go. It was something I had to do. Yeah. And so I had to follow that, you know, my heart. And then I, you know, worked out the rest of it. I was perhaps willing to take a risk and used to being a risk taker. Um, but uh, now I have a, I have a guy, a financial guy who does that for me, the investing. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, great questions. Really appreciate them coming through. Larry have absolutely loved chatting with you today. How can the viewers connect in with you, find out more about what you're doing or even get access to your book? Yes, please. Um, my website is LarryJacobson.com. Uh, J-A-C-O-B-S-O-N. Excellent. And on there, you'll find, if you look, click on the author page, you'll find my books, which are, uh, I brought, since you've got your book up there. Uh, this is The Boy Behind the Gate. It's a hardbound uh, book of the story of the six-year sailing ship around the world with beautiful color photos and, and uh, it's, uh, has won six literary awards. Wow. Yeah. And uh, right. so, um, in fact, there's a picture of, of uh, the boat as we came back underneath the gate. Wow. Yeah. And then there's the children's book a version of it, which is called Let's Go. And it's for eight to 12 year olds. And it's really fun. And then um, on Udemy, uh, there's a course um, called Navigating Entrepreneurship, which is a mirror of the uh, book, Navigating Entrepreneurship. Amazing. Right. And that's all on my website. And then my coaching services are on there as well. I coach on leadership, but I coach on retirement and sales and public speaking. Amazing. And um, yeah, and when speaking comes back, then I want to hear from everybody about that as well, because that's what I love to do. Yeah. So if you want to connect in, LarryJacobson.com. I really appreciated having you on the show today. Uh, thank you so much too for everyone who's uh, jumped on hung out, watched us, uh, followed us, and also asked the amazing questions. We look forward to seeing each and every one of you guys on the next Freedom Series session. Thanks for your time, Larry.